Are you washed in the blood, in the soul?
in the blood of the Lamb. Power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power, blood of the Lamb. Power,
Grace that they've been given, just like Judas did that day. There was forgiveness, but he chose silver over streets of gold. Still, Jesus loved him and would have saved his troubled soul. All he had to do was ask, but that's what Judas didn't know. All you have to do is ask, but that's what Judas didn't know. got to do is ask that's what the word of God says today is the day of salvation not tomorrow and uh, it's been a good day I'm telling you God is good isn't he All the time. Right. He is. can we just give the Lord a hand clap of praise for being so worthy Let me get this. Yeah. I'm telling you I had a had a really good time today and was just able to, uh, to get out and just to, to roam with Brother Randy. And so uh, I've been blessed today, amen. And uh, we, had a, we had a good time. Uh, he's promised he's going to carry me back so I can play on his toys. He's got some big toys that I like to drive. And uh, so, but I'm glad that one day mercy walked in, amen.
chains, they were broken, and I felt born again. The moment when mercy was seen, oh, oh when mercy was in, and he pleaded my case and called to the stands and God saving grace the blood was presented and it covered my sins forgiven when mercy walks in And it covered my sins Forgiven when mercy walks in Mercy walks in Well, the Hebrew boys were thrown into the fire Because they told the king they would not bow But they said, listen, king, and you will know We serve a living God, we're not alone Well, then I know my God can do it To him there's nothing to it I know he'll see me through a sweet victory and him when the storms are raging he is the rock of ages i know that he's able mighty is he well they marched around the walls of jericho they knew that they were fall god told them so just as he's worth that then he's working now my god will never change she has great power will and i know my god can do it to him there's nothing to it i know he'll see me through a sweet victory and, and when the storms are raging he is the rock of ages i know that he is able mighty is he well then i know my god can do it to him there's nothing to it i know you'll see me through a sweet victory and then when the storms are raging he is the rock of ages i know that he is able mighty is he well, i know that he is able mighty is he around the walls of Jericho they knew that they would fall God told them so just as he's worked by then he's working out my God will never change he has great power well and I know my God can do it to him there's nothing to it I know he'll see me through a sweet victory and, and when the storms are raging, He is the rock of ages. I know that He's able, mighty is He. Well, and I know my God can do it to Him. There's nothing to it. I know He'll see me through a sweet victory. And, and when the storms are raging, He is the rock of ages. I know that He is able, mighty is He. Well, I know that he is a mighty is he. Amen. He's a mighty God. Amen. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they said they wouldn't bow to no king except to the one true king, Jehovah God. That's who they were going to bow to. 
And even though, they said, even though, let it be known. Let it be known that we will not bow to your idol, that we serve the risen Savior. I want you to understand today, I take a truckload of folks like, like that, that wouldn't bow, bend, or break, that love the Lord or are sold out to the Lord. I just got to brag a little bit on the church. Is that all right? Is that all right? I love to talk about the church. We travel and we go into a lot of churches. It's so good to see men that aren't afraid to come to the altar. I want to tell you, I saw more men in the altar in this church since we've been here. Uh, it, it's, it's wonderful to see men that aren't afraid to come and to pray, to, to shed a tear to realize that they serve the King of kings and the Lord of lords. That's what excites me. I said there's more potential in this little church right here than I've seen in some big, large churches that we just come out of. Hello. That they, they ain't got it. They don't understand it. They, they think it's just to come to church. It's to come and sit in their spot. But my friend, the men here realize it's more than just a spot. It's a spot that Jesus filled in their heart. That's what it's about, and I, that thrills my soul to see. Uh, Y'all put a new spunk in my step. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to leave, leave here headed to Texacana, and I'm going to tell our church, I said, there's men in the altar up there. What y'all going to do about that? I know what my pre preacher would say. We're going we gonna to pray. That's what we're going to do. But we are so honored to be with you and just to fellowship. And to, uh, We have enjoyed so much the fellowship. We... Uh, we're talking again about the, the 530 fellowship. And, you know, whenever he called me back, Brother Handy didn't said we're going to eat before I go, oh, that's nice. You know, especially singing and, and preaching on a full stomach, that's just nice. And uh, But I have so much enjoyed the fellowship, getting to see the church come out every night. That is so awesome. And, and so we are just honored to be with you all. We're mostly honored to brag on the name of Jesus because that's what it's about. It's about him. I want to introduce everybody real quick and then we'll get back. The young lady over here singing the tenor, she has lost her bass voice and it has started back up. You know? And she is doing, she just said, she said, I'm making it through. I said, I told you you would. And she's doing a wonderful job. Would you make my future daughter-in-law, Miss Ashley Dawson, welcome tonight. And the young man, that she sees something in him, I don't understand. I, I, I've told her, you've got time, and she says, I, I'm all right. And, but uh, I'm honored that my son stands beside me and sings and writes songs and uh, plays the box. I mean, your dad will be real proud of you playing a box, you know. And, uh, but uh, I'm thankful that he loves the Lord. Amen. Would you make Mr. Jonathan Talley welcome? And back there in the back, I'm honored about this young man right here. Even though he's not my blood kin, uh, I'd be honored to call him my son because he loves the Lord. And, uh, and I'm seeing what God is doing in his life. And um, he's going to preach to you tonight in just a little bit. And I'm excited. I'm always excited to hear, uh, you know, whenever I push him out there, you know, he's kind of like, like an eagle. you got to just carry him up and turn him loose. And so... <laughs> He's, he's like, but why tonight? There's 13 preachers here. Why tonight? But he, he's going to, he, he loves the Lord. And would you make Mr. Stephen Hayes welcome in the back? One of these days, I'm going to twist her arm to get up and share during one of the services and, and uh, share what God's done, done in her life. And would you make my beautiful wife, Penny Talley, welcome tonight? And the man plays the guitar over here. Well, yeah. No. But uh, he started the group 25 years ago and preaches, plays the guitar, plays the piano, drives the bus, fits the bus, lots of us, keeps us, in, keeps us straight. But leads the group, my dad, David, to make them. This song, uh, me and John and Ashley wrote wrote this song and we never really realized that it would be out on the radio but we're honored that we got a call last week that it's made it on two different charts and so we're excited about that 
not because of the numbers, but because of the fact that we're hoping it opens doors for us to go out into ministry and to tell other folks about Jesus and what he can do. And I love the message of this song. It's entitled, He's Right There. Turn to the master, he'll be there for you. Know what he's there by your side, he's leading you through day and night. Know that the Lord will be there for you. in our Christian walk there are days that we we're seeking the Lord and we're listening to what God says and but then there are days that we just want to be alone and cry with the Lord just to fellowship and I, I love the message of this song and sometimes I hurt and sometimes I cry but just know this the Bible says that he sticks closer than a brother I looked apart, then it went to rest of the church crowd. I know the routine, I can list all the Bible studies and tell. Watch Christian TV, I know all the preachers, their cliches. Born again without a doubt, I know I'm saved, but sometimes I hurt Ooh, and sometimes I cry, sometimes I can't get it right, no matter how hard I seem to try. Sometimes I fall down, stumble over my own disguise, cause the truth. 
tried to look strong as the whole world looks on sometimes alone I cry I try to speak faith then forgive that devil morning singing in I do worship and praise everybody just knows just where they on the back of my ride, there's this vision I cross for the world to see. I know my God is good all of the time. There's no hell for me. Ooh, but sometimes I Sometimes I can't get it all right No matter how hard I seem to try Sometimes I fall down I stumble over my own disguise Cause I try to look strong As the whole world looks on Sometimes alone Try to look strong as the whole world looks so. Sometimes alone I cry. Ooh, yeah, yes. Ooh, yeah. Stephen, if you'll make your way on up here, buddy. You know, I'm excited about Stephen, and uh, I want you to understand that when God calls you, and if you're sitting there or running from a call right now, I want you to pay attention. Because this is way out of Stephen's comfort zone. Now, I remember that day, but Scott, don't you? Stephen, he was going to get up and give his testimony up at Brother Scott's church. And he walked up there and he said a few things and he looked up at the ceiling and he said, Yes, Lord. And I said, What is he doing? And all of a sudden he just said, I'm going to answer the call to surrender to preach. I mean, just like that. And uh, so I'm excited, Brother, you preach. Preach what God's put on your heart. You know, my entire life, I've been in church, done everything that you're supposed to do to signify you're a Christian. But it wasn't until this past February, February the 22nd, that I actually got saved. Just because you're in church, and I want you to remember this tonight throughout the message, just because you're in church, just because you're at a revival service, just because you come to church every time them doors are unlocked doesn't mean you're going to go to heaven. It's all about having a personal relationship with Jesus. And you know, God gave me a sermon today, and, it, and I guess I'd title it, Where is America? Where do we find America in the Bible? The U.S. The answer is, um, the U.S. is not there. The U.S. is not specifically mentioned in the Bible. But from a little research and a little reading in the Bible, I kind of found out where, where we are as a country. The best passage that in time that I could place us in was in the time of Judah when they had so much wickedness running around in sin. And you know, as a church... We've got to be the light in the wicked world. We've got to be the light that people see, that they see that they actually need Jesus. 
Because if they just see us being like the world, they're not going to see Jesus. And if we leave here and we act like the world, then we need to evaluate where we are in our relationship with God. You know, I mean, around here we are in a rural area. You don't see the wickedness that Jeremiah, that God sent him to tell him what they were doing. You don't see that in rural America. But when you get to the big city, it's very clear what kind of wicked, sinful nation we have become. I remember we took a trip down to uh, New Orleans, and our friend Brother Mike that lives down in Denham Springs, he wanted to take us to uh, Bourbon Street, yeah. And we'd all heard about it, but until you go and see it, you don't realize how bad it really is. And you know, it's just, I believe that the hurricane and everything that came in down there and September 11th that happened to the U.S. is signs from God that we need to wake up and turn back to Him. You know, that if we don't get right, that just as the country of Judah, He's going to say enough is enough. And the text tonight is going to come from uh, Jeremiah chapter 5. And when you have your place, you'll stand in honor of the reading of God's word. Run ye to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem, and see now and know, and seek in the broad places thereof. If you can find a man, if there be if there be any that executeth judgment, that speaketh the truth, and I will pardon it. And though they say the Lord liveth, surely they, they sweat falsely. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. Therefore, I say, Surely those, surely these are poor, they are foolish. For they know not the way of the, of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. I will get me unto the great men, and will speak unto them. For they have known the way of the Lord, and the judgment of, the, of God. But these have altogether broken the yoke, and burst the bonds. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you, Lord, just for another opportunity, Lord, to stand up here, Lord, and just to proclaim, Lord, what you've laid on my heart, Lord. I just pray, Lord, that you'd be with me, Lord, tonight, Lord, that it wouldn't be what I want to say, Lord, but it would be what you would have me say, Lord. Lord, and I just thank you, Lord, just for what you're going to do tonight in this service, Lord, and what you're going to do the rest of this revival, Lord, and even after we leave, Lord. Lord, and it's in your name I pray. Amen. In verse 1, God told Jeremiah to go find one person that wasn't wicked. One person that wasn't full of the devil. Because if you're not full of God, then you're full of the devil. You know, he said, go find that one person that would be of the way. Verse 2, their worship, the worship that they had was just an act. It says, and though they say the Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. You know, it wasn't true worship. It wasn't the worship that Matthew 15, 8 indicates that we should have. And it says that. This people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. That was the worship they had. They came to church. They did all the right things while they were in church. And when they left church, they lived a different way. 
just as in the U.S. is what happens. You get out in the world, you go to your job, you go out to Walmart, and you get drew into what everybody else is doing. And you, we, we're around it so much that if you don't keep a close guard, you'll be drawn right into it. And it, it doesn't matter how much you come to church. If you don't watch it, you're going to be drawn in to what the world's doing. Hebrews 13, 15 says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to God continually that it's the fruit of our lips giving thanks to his name. We should never quit praising God for what he's done for us, for saving us, for setting us free from our sin, for giving us a new name, a new name that's written down in glory. And one day when he comes back, that we have that blessed assurance that we're going home, that we're not going to stay in this wicked, sinful world forever. But while we're here, we've been told to tell the good news of what Jesus has done for us and what he'll do for other people if they'll accept him as their Lord and Savior. The key is they've got to accept him. It's like the, the sermon Brother David told about I preached about counterfeit Christianity. The devil, he knows who God is. He believes God exists. He believes in God. He's missing one little thing. He forgot to accept it. And that's the the same thing. That's the reason I said you're either full of God or you're full of the devil. Because you've either accepted him or you haven't. Judah, they forsook the truth. They listened what, to what happened in church. Just as people do today, they come to church and they listen to the preacher and listen to the singer. But when they leave, they don't change. They just or in other words, they just sell grace out short. They sell it out for a nickel. They come, they get saved, they come to church, but it never sinks in and it never changes them. You know, it's not what we believe that makes us a Christian. It's what people see we do. That's what draws them to Christ. It's not what you go out and say, well, I believe in Jesus. And the next minute, you're cussing up a storm or you're doing something that is so ungodly that they say, well, you're no different than I am. I don't need your Jesus. If you're going to live like I do, what has Jesus done for you? You know, a lot of people, they say they don't want to get saved because they'll have to quit doing what they're doing. Well, this day and time, you, don't, you can look at some people in the church and it looks like they never got saved. You know, over in verse 6, Wherefore a lion out of the forest shall, shall slay them, and a wolf of the evening shall spoil them. A leopard shall watch over the cities. Every one that goeth out shall be torn in pieces, because their transgressions are many, and their backslidings are increased. If we don't wake up as a country, as a church, as a nation... The power of God, which is what protects the United States and protects us. It's not our great army. It's not the missile defense system. It's God. And if God takes his hand off us, a little bitty minute country that we think is no threat to us can destroy us. The different animals that he was talking about in that passage. There is different foreign powers and who would stand up when God's hand was taken off of Judah that was standing up, that was standing ready to destroy him. Because they saw a prime target. Because other people realize in our lives, in the shape of the country, in anything, that when you have God, that nothing can harm me. But they also realize and they also see when God takes his hand off of you that you're at your, your weakest. And if we allow that to happen,
you know, I look at it as when David fought Goliath. David just a little old boy about this tall compared to Goliath. Literally. I mean, when you think about it. If he hadn't had the power of God, Goliath could have stepped on him and killed him. But with the power of God, he took a little rock, a little pebble that he got off the ground, put it in his little sling and shot it and killed him. Because God, not because of anything he did. You remember that it's not man. We didn't make this country great. The reason this country became what it is and as big as it is is because the forefathers founded on Christian values, which we've forgotten about. Maybe not us, but the rest of the country has forgotten about. And we've got to live in a way that they see that we're missing something. You know, there was a thing on Facebook, and it had this guy, he was in prison, reading the Bible. And there was another picture of a family sitting at home reading the Bible, and it said, if we had more of this, sitting at home reading the Bible, teaching your kids about the Bible, there'd be less of someone in jail accepting Christ. They would have done, got their life right. They would have done, got right with God. They wouldn't have had to go out and commit a crime and be sent to a prison to hear the gospel. They would have heard it at home. They would have heard it at school. But now in a public school, you can't even say the name of Jesus. Somebody will be there ready to cart you off. And the day is coming. And if we don't stand up, and it's going to happen in churches. Just as it happened in the times of old and the church was persecuted. And people are still persecuted overseas. We don't think about that because that's not how we live day to day. But if we don't stand up and start telling the good news about what Jesus can do in people's lives, that's going to happen right here in our great country. You know, Judah, another thing, they practice idolatry. Now, I'm not saying that in the U.S. we go out and we build a big carved image and we worship it. We do the opposite. We have stuff in our lives. We're a materialistic society. And we like things. You know, whether it be going to a football game, whether it be watching a football game on TV, whether it be playing music, whether it be just our lives in general, if we put that, any of that, in front of what God wants us to do and in front of coming to church and doing stuff of God, then that becomes an idol in our lives. And if you don't see it yet, we're, we're really, as a country, as a, a church, we're starting to really line up with what Jeremiah went and preached against Judah and told them the coming destruction if they didn't turn. Jesus has to be the center of our lives. He can't be your co-pilot. He better be the pilot of your life. He better be telling you where to go, how to go. And if you don't know him, my friend, right now is the time to accept him. Not the next minute. You need to get down here and you need to accept Jesus right now because we're not promised the next second. Judah, in verse 12, it says, uh, They have belief. Oh, they have bellied the Lord and said it's not he neither shall evil come upon us neither shall we see sword nor famine and if you think about it the U.S. we think we're so big so bad so tough that nothing can destroy us but God can and he will don't know when it's coming but if we don't turn back to him as a nation it's going to happen like I said well ago, you can have an army. You can have a vast arsenal of weapons to defend your country or anything. But when God gets fed up with you, the end's the end. Whether it be he gets fed up with us and he sends Jesus back to come get Christians and take them out of the mess, or he destroys America while we're still here. Oh, 
many today, they preach from the pulpit that God's a loving God. And he don't punish sin. Hey, the first part's right. But God's a just God. And he asks that we follow his commandments. He is coming back. And another thing I see as a country, we don't truly fear God anymore. The name God is used so recklessly. I mean, it's used as a swear word, a cuss word. Psalms 112 said, Blessed is a man who fears God, who greatly desires delights in his commandments. You know, if we don't follow what God has has told us to do, which is when you're saved, the Great Commission, go out and tell others. That's not just for preachers, by the way. That's for everybody. And I, I like to use the excuse, I don't really like to talk to people I don't know. That's a sorry excuse, and I know it. But it's hard to get over. It's hard to get over. Because you're not comfortable just walking up to somebody you don't know and start telling them about Jesus. We should be. But I know I'm not. And I've been praying that God would help me in that. But you can't use that kind of stuff as an excuse. When we do, you see people perish and go to hell. Just like Brother David said, we're going to be together in a couple of weeks for Thanksgiving. We're going to sit down with our families and probably many of our family members don't know Jesus. And we know they don't. But the name of Jesus will never be brought up. The prayer will be said, thank God for everything you've given us. And, you know, yada, yada, yada. But other than that, you're going to eat. They're going to want to watch the football game probably. They're going to leave, go about their way, and you're going to go about their, your way. And the name of Jesus won't ever be brought up about getting saved. Because we're scared we're going to offend them. But my friend, it's better to offend them, let them be mad at you, than not tell them about Jesus at all and just let them go to hell. You know, they should have to run through us and jump into hell. They shouldn't have to, they shouldn't just fall off into hell because we haven't done anything. They should have to run and jump over us to get there. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14 says, If my people, which are called by name, my name, will humble themselves and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal their land. That's the answer to it all. We've got to continually pray for our leaders, for the president, for anyone that might be in office. As bad as we may not like them or what they're doing, they're there for a reason. And we must pray for them. And pray by some miracle of God that they'll see the light. Because what do you think would happen if tonight Mr. Obama got saved? People would see a change in this country. Everything that has been passed law-wise, it's against God. Abortion, the issue of the same-sex marriage, it would all have to be repealed. Because as a Christian, he couldn't stand for that. But we just have to keep praying and asking God to show him the light. And I, you know, you can tell people 
about Jesus until Jesus comes back. And the sad thing about it is, so uh, once you tell them, it's up to them. Once you tell them, and you keep telling them, it's still up to them. We can't save them, but God can. We can pray to God to save them. And it may take time. But most of the time, they'll see the light if they see it in you. The other option, if we sit back and do nothing, is just as Judah, destruction will surely come. September the 11th was a wake-up call to this country from God to wake up that you're not following me that you're not serving the one true God, that you're so busy in your life. And for a short time, Americans came together as one and prayed, even though all of them might not have been saved, they were in services in New York City, in every big city they were having memorial services for September the 11th. And they were all together for a very short time. And then it went back to business as usual, everyday life. I just pray it doesn't take another September the 11th or something worse to wake up America. Similarities in Jeremiah's time is like I said, they had idolatry and they worshipped idols. Our time, we're in the materialistic age. In Jeremiah's time, they had child sacrifices. We don't have no better. We have abortion. There's nothing right about killing an innocent little baby and done nothing to anybody. It doesn't matter the circumstance. They haven't done anything to anybody. And that is life that God has breathed into them. And that's a soul that's living. And in their time, they had rampant immorality. In our time, we have rising immorality. In Jeremiah's time, they had no godly leaders. We have some godly leaders. So what it all comes down to, will you pray and live a life that others can see Jesus in you? Or will you live like the world? It's ultimately our choice. We can just turn a deaf ear to the world and turn our back to it. Or we can pray for them to get saved and show them what Jesus can do for them. Show them what he did in our lives. Like I said, we should have to make them jump over us to get to hell. really kind of sad when God gave me this sermon to really see where we really are as a country. But God can turn it all around. In one breath, it can all be fixed. If enough people will turn from their wicked ways and call upon Him, He's going to heal our land. He's going to heal the USA. We're going to see a move of God like never before. It talks about in the Bible as the latter rain. And there's going to be a move of God like never before. But that's only going to happen if we pray for it. And we pray for a great harvest. But tonight, if you don't know this Jesus, and you're here tonight, and you've been in church your entire life, and you just don't feel Jesus 
in your life. Brother David and him come back. Because my friend, it's, again, God keeps putting this on me, but it's up to us. He wants to send a great revival. He wants to do it again, just like he did with Evan Roberts in Wales. He wants that to happen in the United States. He wants people to be saved. He doesn't want anyone to go to hell. But we've got to pray for this great revival. And the key to anything that you might be going through tonight, and the key to life itself is prayer and knowing Jesus and tonight with everyone's heads bowed and eyes closed I just want to know tonight if there's somebody in the house that just feels like they don't know this Jesus they don't have a personal relationship that if you were to die at this very moment that you wouldn't go to be with Jesus in heaven. And tonight you want to get that right. I'm going to say a prayer here in a few moments. And you can repeat after me. But it's got to be you asking Jesus into your heart. It's not anything that I'm doing. It's all about what you're asking Jesus to do for you personally. Tonight, if you want to ask Jesus into your heart, just repeat after me. Dear Lord, I'm sorry that I've sinned. I'm sorry I fell short of you, Lord. And right now, ask for Jesus to come into my heart. I believe that he came walked among us was crucified and three days later arose and I asked him to come live in my heart and from this day forward I will follow him all of my days Tonight, if you said that prayer and you asked Jesus into your heart and you truly meant it, you asked Jesus for a personal relationship, if you just slip your hand up. While you're still praying, I want you to pray for something. You know, all this week we've talked about inviting people, inviting folks to come. I believe, as Stephen shared with you, we want to see America return back to its first love. That's only going to happen if we get serious. We ourselves get serious in serving the Lord. I was thinking today as we were riding and looking at the beautiful farmland, I'm thinking how they are already preparing for next year's crop. They're plowing and they've already seeded some seeds in the ground. So here's what I'm asking you. Are you sowing seeds? Are you sowing seeds? into other people presenting the gospel to them. I'm not just asking you if you're talking to them. I'm asking you, are you sowing some seeds into them? Telling them what Jesus can do in their life and what he's done in your life. Telling them how to be saved. 
We need to be like the farmers right now, sowing ahead, preparing for what's coming. Father, right now, we thank you for what you're doing. We thank you for the message that's been presented. But right now, in this invitation time, Lord, I pray that you would speak to people's hearts as you have. Lord, I know you spoke to my heart. And Father, I ask you that you would just make it so real in our life of how much we need to serve you more than we ever have. Lord, if there's a person here that's hurting right now, that's just going through a battle, Lord, you're right here. Let them know. Let them realize that they'll just come to you. Pray and confess that you will forgive them. And Lord, if there is one here that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, and might not have had the boldness to slip that hand up, but they prayed that prayer and asked the Lord to save them. God, I pray you'd give them boldness in just a few moments. And Lord, you have your way in this invitation time. In Jesus' name. Would you stand? I invite you to come and pray. That's the key, folks. Prayer is the key. We want, we've talked about great revivals. We want to see revivals. It's going gonna, it's gonna to happen when we as a church gather together and continue to pray. And we seek the face of God. And He becomes real in our life. If you need to come, you come on right now and pray. Pray for that lost person. Sow some seeds, y'all. Just like the farmers that are out there. They've been sowing seeds. And they've been building up the rows and getting them ready for next year's harvest. Anybody want to see a harvest? I know I do. I want to see a great move. I want to see a move like we've never seen before. And guess what? It can happen. When we pray and we seek the face of God and we cry out to Him and say, Lord, get me out of the way. I want to do what you want me to do. Is He real in your life?
I want to ask you something. When's the last time you carried your wife to the altar and prayed for her? Dads, when's the last time you carried your whole family and prayed for them? We talk about want to see change in America. How to make a change. How to make a change. tell you a lot of men been moving and I love it when's the last time you brought your wife down and prayed with her I'm telling you God's doing something and I'm like it we're going to sing another verse plenty of room plenty of room day we go through singing praises to the King we go to Sunday school but do we learn nothing it's time to spread the word of Christ church Stand for what we believe. So it's God real in your life, or is He just a dream? Who will see? I hope you enjoyed that service. And if God spoke to you during that service and you've realized that you need a Savior and that you're lost and undone, and why don't you call out to the Lord? He's just waiting to hear from you. He already knows, and you know as well as anybody, if the Holy Spirit is drawing you. And right where you're at, you can call upon him. See, God can hear a whisper all the way to heaven from right where you're at because he sees your heart. Why don't you ask him to come in and be your Lord and Savior, to forgive you of your sins? He's waiting on you, but it's something that you have to do. If you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart, then you don't have a personal relationship. But that's what it takes. That's what it takes to know Jesus Christ is a personal relationship. So if that's you and you, you would like to receive Jesus into your heart and start this relationship, I'd ask you to pray with me. But pray in faith, believing that he'll save you. And he says he'll do just that. So why don't you pray with me? Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. And I know that you died for me. Lord Jesus, I believe that you died and you rose again. And right now, 
you're in heaven. Lord Jesus, I'm lost, and I need you to save me. Forgive me of my sins and come into my life and be my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for saving my soul. Now I want to live the rest of my life serving you. Amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer in faith and asked the Lord to save you, I want to be the first to tell you that you're saved and that you're on your way to heaven if you prayed that prayer in faith and believed and asked God. We'd like to hear from you. You can contact us at thecrusaders-ministries.com. You can find us on Facebook. Send us a message or give me a call, 870-904-3118. We'd like to find out where you're at and get you involved in a local church, try to help you start your walk with Jesus Christ in a positive way. But we're excited what God has done, and we look forward to hearing from you. And if you'd like to partner with the Crusaders, you can become uh, a seed partner by sowing a seed and meeting a need. We're a 501c3. We're a nonprofit organization. You can go to our website, thecrusaders-ministries.com, and you can give safe and secure there. You can give a one-time tax deductible donation, or you can set it up to do monthly, and it can just come straight out of your account. Whatever it is that God has placed upon your heart, I pray you'd be faithful to do that. And, of course, if you have any questions or concerns, you can contact me, David, at 870-904-3118. Thank you again for watching this service, and I pray it was a blessing to you. And God bless you.